good, everybody, and welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily. It's Monday, June 24th, 2019. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by the best hair in the business, Fran Mirabella III. Ahoy hoy, what is up? Good morning, Andrea. How are Happy you? Happy Monday, Fran. Happy Monday, yeah. I was feeling a little tired until I saw you and you just woke me up. I've got all kinds of energy today. She does. I had a nice, relaxing weekend after Ooh. we both did some streaming. Uh, we didn't stream yes. together, though. We've never streamed together. Yeah, well, we need to. Uh, maybe one time during the division? Yep. Yeah, we crossed paths for it a while. It didn't go there, well. Didn't we? It didn't go well. Uh, whose fault is that, Kevin? Yours. Yeah. You know, oh. Gary, Gary oh, Witt is streaming now. Oh, is he? Yeah. So be sure to. I think it's just slash Gary Witta, but he's been out there and he's doing like just chatting and I think he's talking about like his, his experience. In life, and we know he has a lot of it. Yes, so. he does. He's a very entertaining person, that Gary Witta. Um, in case you didn't realize, this, of course, is Kind of Funny Games Daily, your source for nerdy video game news in the morning, each and every weekday, right here at twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. We ask you guys to help keep us honest by going to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong to let us know what we screw up as we screw it up so we can set the record straight for everybody listening on podcast services around the globe. And, of course, watching at youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames. If you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, that'd help us out a lot. We'd really appreciate it. It would make us feel good and give some warm and fuzzies inside. Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to go a step further, though, and become one of our awesome patrons at patreon.com slash kindoffunnygames, where you can get involved with the show by sending in your questions, your squad up requests, and, you know, anything else that your little heart desires. We do have a little bit of housekeeping. Today, uh, we have some exciting news. Well, if you've been watching the crew on social media, you may have already heard the news. It's the project you've been waiting one whole year for. This Sunday, the video version of Kinda Funny Prom goes live on YouTube at youtube.com slash kinda funny. Come see Smash Mouth shock the world. Greg (laughs) marries two kinda funny best friends and Tim and Gia crowd surf. Subscribe right now. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Perfect. It was actually a ton of fun, and if you guys weren't there, mm-hmm. which I'm not surprised, the, the the tickets sold out like super quickly, and yeah. the venue wasn't super large, so not a, not a lot of best friends were able to make it into prom. But now you can experience what happened at Kind of Funny Prom for God, yourself. It was so oh God, much does that fun. mean the Oasis thing is on there, Kevin? Uh, yeah, I imagine. What Oasis I've, thing? Uh, so, um, gosh, I feel bad for what was the couple's name that got engaged on there? You say the married couple. Well, the uh, couple that is now married, who I know, and I'm sorry, I'm forget- it's Eric and someone I think, but um, I don't think it's Eric. Any, it's wrong. not. I got it wrong. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm bad sorry. With names too. I'm this bad is a kind of funny. Dot com slash you're wrong. <laughs> Why did I bring it up? I was gonna get it wrong. Anyway, uh, <laughs> at the beginning, they asked me to just like play like a little Oasis uh, opening to. Um, uh, it was boy. as good it's, as it sounds. It's Monday, everybody. It was phenomenal. So, you did a great um, I can't remember the name you, of the song. That's uh, kind of Monday. In case that isn't exciting it. for you, how about <laughs> I get to sing on stage with Smash Mouth? Oh, you did. That's yes, right. It was, That's amazing. It was a really fun, amazing lives moment. we live. It was great. Um, so yeah, so this Sunday, keep an eye out for that. Plus, we want to say thank you to our fantastic Patreon producers, Daniel Massey, Black Jack, Colton Yoder, and Muhammad Muhammad. And today, the show is brought to you by Third Love and Experian, but we'll tell you more about that later. For now, let's begin with what is and forever will be the Rover Report. Time for some news. Four items on the Rover Report. A baker's dozen. Oh, I yeah. like it. It's kind of like Price is Right style. It is. Come on Never watched down. It. It was Wonderwall, by the way. Man, Mondays are tough for me. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, the news. More coffee for Fran next time. Yeah, I okay. got some. First up, we had mentioned this, and now I'm going to give you all of the details. Streamer raises almost $1 million for charity in just four hours. Whoa. So this write-up comes from Luke Plunkett over at Kotaku. Guardian Con, which began a few years back as a small Destiny Con and has since grown into an all-weekend show held in July in Orlando, also runs a week-long charity stream, which has just raised over $3 million for a children's hospital in Memphis. As Forbes report. Excuse me. As Forbes reports, the stream operated in four hour blocks with streamers, teams and even some companies taking part. Bungie, for example, raised four hundred thousand dollars in their four hours. But the big bucks really came in during Ben Dr. Lupo's 
turned during playing Fortnite when over $920,000 was donated. The money came from sources as varied as Fortnite streamer Ninja to State Farm Insurance and all goes directly to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Viewers were encouraged to donate with stretch goals built into each stream. Bungie, for example, showed off some of Destiny 2's new weapons, while Lupo played with some self-imposed handicaps like not being able to build in Fortnite. Guardian Con's charity stream hoped to raise $3 million, but at the end, they tallied three million seven hundred twenty one thousand and ninety seven dollars so awesome congratulations yeah. to dr lupo and everybody uh, of course fran and, and i both participated you? in the guardian con stream yeah yeah how much did you raise we raised over nine thousand yeah that's dollars. amazing Every, <laughs> any amount is amazing honestly like yeah. anyone out there contributing to the cause like uh you can actually even still contribute to it i believe there's like a link you can you can do your own charity stream obviously and continue to donate to saint jude but how much did you raise, um i was on destiny community podcast which really i was like i'm the new guy on there so they already do amazing job every year but we did um over seventy thousand. One contribution i was telling andrea was over tw uh, was twenty five thousand dollars so that's Whoa. yeah you get some of these really amazing supporters that absolutely really and like they said here uh, you know in dr lupo's stream having a partner like state farm insurance come in and be able to make a big dollar donation is really huge obviously ninja has done a lot of charitable uh fundraising in his time as well mm -hmm. but dr lupo is known for yeah he's um, his fantastic charity fundraising he's efforts always so. crushing it they had um, to put him last it. Uh, at the stream it, schedule. Yeah. yeah, because before, I think it was, I don't know if it was a couple years ago now, he went before some people. And so when you have to follow that act up, it's just a lot of pressure. Yeah. So they know now to end with Dr. Lupo, and rightly so, uh, nearly reaching his million dollar goal. And I have no doubt that he will next year. So. Yeah. So there was a, it was a, a lot of fun to be had by all. If you guys want to catch any of those archives, because lots of shenanigans were had during these blocks, you can go to twitch.tv slash guardian con. You can see all the video archives yeah. there. Yeah. I uh, sang Old Town Road to open up our stream. Oh, I've I'm seen sure that, that clip, that, Fran. I'm sure everybody's seen it. <laughs> and also, uh, out of nowhere, I was like, all right, I tell you what, for 500, I will, I had my, uh, my slight beard going and I said, I'll shave my mustache on stream. So I like buzzed a mustache on stream. It turned into a Fu Manchu, so a lot of fun. Uh, also <laughs> should note, I will be at Guardian Con on July 5th and 6th uh, in Orlando, Florida. So if you're out there, in fact, I might even be there a few days early in Orlando. So if you're around, hit me up on Twitter at Fran Mirabella and uh, would love to see y'all out there. You could do a, you could do an F, M3 underscore meetup, Fran. Fran. They call it FranCon, Fran as if Con? that'll ever happen. But um, yeah, I would love to see people there. That is uh, what Guardian Con is all about. If you guys don't know, more than anything, it's just walking around, talking to people. And you all know this by now as best friends, like walk up and say hello to anyone that you recognize because it's always flattering, it's always awesome, and we want to talk to everybody don't touch and vice versa. Let you. No touching though, like Kevin. Unless yeah. they let you. He had some, some well, serious red flags this morning. What do you which mean? I can't even tell you about. What? You tried we're to not fight me. We're not discussing that. Fran we're moving on to, to the me. next story in the Roper Report. And I wasn't scared. Which is Sony Patents Target Reduced <clears throat> Load Times. So this write-up comes from Matt Persla over at IGN. Fran, you pulled this one. Would you like to read it? Absolutely. I would love to. Uh, so yeah, Sony, we know with the PlayStation 5 has already been touting faster load times, getting in on that SSD and um, and newer SSD technology in the whole pipeline of setup. But to take it a step further, it seems, now we don't know if this is necessarily for PS5, but you can assume it is. Um, again, Matt Perzo at IGN, the story goes like this. Sony has patented a new technology that will help removing, will help remove loading screens from games that use it. The patent is titled System and Method for Dynamically Loading Game Software for Smooth Gameplay. It almost sounds like a Japanese drink or something that you could buy. <laughs> you know, they have these really long descriptions. I didn't think about anyway, it that way. <laughs> it's like a coffee drink. Anyway, uh, it describes a technology that loads in data in advance in order to prevent load screens. Man, why didn't we think about this before this patent? Sorry, I'm in a weird mood today. Uh, the patent explains like that the system can monitor the player's character and use this information to load in new areas in preparation as the player approaches them. Uh, quote, a load boundary associated with a game environment is identified. A position of a character in the game environment is then monitored. Instructions corresponding to another game environment are loaded into the memory when the character crosses the load boundary such that gameplay is not interrupted. So yeah, as the story goes, effectively this means if the game detects that you're approaching this boundary of the environment, it is just loaded in. So um, anyway, we know load times are 
well, we don't know, but seemingly this could be the biggest differentiator of why to put a console in your living room as we're moving to a cloud and you know things like Stadia and xCloud and whatever Sony's working on. But uh, what do you think of this, Andrea? Does this um, excite you at all? <laughs> Absolutely. I think what's really the most exciting about the upcoming generation is this current generation we're in is moved a lot in the right direction to having some form of parity in hardware between PC and console. Obviously PC, the clear superior platform when we're talking about technical yeah, prowess, wise. right? And so I think this next generation is gonna like close that gap even a little bit more. I still think we have maybe one or two more generations to go until they're the same. Because when we're on when we're talking about a cloud only platform, then really your hardware doesn't matter, right? That's how, Stadia's whole pitch is like you play Stadia on your PC, play it on your mobile phone, it's right. gonna play the same. Still depends on what's in the cloud though, right? How expensive are your servers that you're able to duplicate right, for two hundred million? But that's people. not a uh, that cost isn't on the consumer. Consumer, that cost is no, on the platform meaning, maker, right? I agree with you. We're a generation or two from things getting closer, but we never know. Like, hopefully, the cloud is not so, like. In other words, let's say you're playing on a five hundred dollars system in the cloud. I can still go out and buy a two thousand dollars PC that'll look better potentially. That's you, you know, know what I mean. That. Think well, about it. obviously, the quality of your screen is always going to dictate the visual experience, whether mm -hmm. you're playing on a smartphone or on a thirty inch yeah. monitor on your oh, PC yeah, yeah, or a seventy five well. inch four K television in your living room, right? Mm -hmm. Like so that of course is always gonna play a factor into yeah. the gaming experience. But I'm talking purely about performance and how the game runs. Oh yeah. Um, sure. and so that's to me was why I think these stories about what PS five is doing are really interesting because we've seen that this generation, Xbox One X was you know, dubbed the more powerful console than PS4 Pro. And I think that that's yeah. obvious when you compare them side by side. Mm -hmm. However, we're getting conflicting reports from developers who probably shouldn't be talking about it at all um, about the difference between Xbox Scarlet and PS5. Now, until we get it into our own hands and get to do tests for ourselves, you know, it's just speculation at this time. Mm -hmm. However, I think this is exciting. I would love to see load times reduced. And as you had mentioned, you know, talking about making something the least path of resistance or the the most convenient way to play games when you're have somebody like Stadia or even xCloud coming in to say you don't need that box in your living room anymore yeah. and for PlayStation to say this is why you need that box. I think that for me as a gamer and I've I've continued to say and will continue to say that I don't think streaming is ready um, for the mass majority of gamers around the world. I think this is super exciting for people who have invested in the PlayStation ecosystem. Yep. Yeah. My, I just want to say two things on it. And one is that I uh, brought it up last time we were talking SSDs with PS5s. It, it kind of is ironic. It takes me back to the 90s when Nintendo made the choice Partially was they wanted to sell cartridges, but partially they were right. They were like, they, they don't want load times to be an issue. And it was a huge difference between CD-ROM and um, and cartridges. And so that's why we didn't have huge cutscenes on N64, but you did have experience like Mario 64 where you jump through a painting and man, very quickly you're on the other side of that. And so there's some irony to that. We're still chasing it 20 years later. And so it actually excites me thinking about, you know, even just the, the initial load time, which has been as upwards of 90 seconds or two minutes for even big, big games out there. Reducing that, hopefully, but also once you're in the game, making it just smooth, immersive, and not having to like worry about, yeah, things like transition rooms and the door that they put in front of you. It'll be really interesting to see where that goes. But on that note, I would also bring up how, did, how are they gonna get parity between that and the cloud and like make sure everything works, meaning from a game design perspective, they're still designing for stuff in the cloud now. They're designing for, who knows, your Xbox One version and mm -hmm. we'll see where that goes. Um, I guess that was most of it. Oh no, uh, the other thing I was gonna mention was just that this excites me because I'm very much still excited about the living room experience, the at-home experience, because fidelity is super important and I, I hope we talk about it on this week's GameCast. Uh, games cast, but I played, you know, Stadia at E3 and like, I was really impressed with how well it was working. But fidelity wise, I keep saying, I think people are gonna be surprised and I'm all about it for these reasons. Super fast, high fidelity, 4K, whatever. That is gonna be the differentiator of, um, you know, what's going on between the cloud and in your living room, I think. And what hopefully will make it worth four or 500 bucks. I'm definitely interested to hear what you and Greg have to say about it. I know he got hands on with it mm -hmm. at E3 as well. And I'm glad to hear that you both were impressed because I would hope that Google would make sure to show it in its best light 
I have always maintained my skepticism because, of course, Google's going to show Stadia in its best light to press during right. its flagship tech demo at the, you know, flagship consumer electronics yeah. event of the year. However, once it launches, yeah. it's really going to be the true test to how see does it how does it work in all of these other different scenarios when you're in a hotel, when you're yeah. in an airport, when, when you're in your car, when you're when maybe you at a, home and there's an internet outage and you yeah. have to tether to another device or, or all of these other yeah. like X factors, right? A million right? people are trying to encode Whereas, their video frames to get them back to their hotel rooms, you know? Exactly, but when you plug in PS5, those load times are exactly. going to be consistent no matter where you plug it in. Exactly. So, so that's like the difference you, here, right? I can't wait for you to try it out. It's definitely impressive, but the fidelity factor, meaning watching compressed video as your gameplay, I think is going to be interesting. And you'd be surprised it wasn't showing Stadia in its best light because it wasn't 4K and it wasn't HDR yet. And I think that higher bit rate is the one that, frankly, that is the best looking thing that we need to see. We haven't seen it. They actually showed you the more common experience, 1080p. So I, I, I was a little surprised they did that as well. Um, it was, you know, a bit pixelated. It's Probably to maintain right. the quality of the build would be my I, I guess. I think that as well. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway. All right. Moving on to the next story. Speaking of Bungie and Destiny, mm -hmm. as we've been talking about them a lot over the last couple of days, Bungie has postponed Destiny 2 fixes to, quote, preserve work-life balance of the team. So this write-up comes from Vicky Blake over at Eurogamer. Bungie has pushed back plans to nerf Destiny 2's overpowered Lord of Wolves shotgun in order to preserve work-life balance for the development team. In an attempt to address prior balancing issues, a tweak to the Lord of Wolves has instead inadvertently made it deadly in competitive PvP multiplayer instead. Acknowledging the issue in a recent Bungie update, creative director Lou Smith admitted the most recent changes to the Lord of Wolves created a monster, and the team was looking to reduce the damage resistance later this year. Right now, however, the issue didn't rise up to meet the bar of this is broken enough to turn it off in all activities. Sometimes Destiny is going to have goofy outliers or periods of time where something is OP, like wolves howling right now and Iron Banner on PC, Smith said. We don't want these periods to last too long, post Forsaken launch void locks, but they can be memorable moments. I think we all remember the weekend of uh, laser tag and PvP. Um, internally, mm -hmm. we had a bunch of spirited debate this weekend around whether or not we should just prevent players from equipping Lord of Wolves throughout the game. This is a blunt tool, and basically banning an item from being equipped isn't something we take lightly. As reported by Polygon, Smith said in a Guardian Con 2019 charity stream that instead the studio has opted to fold the fix into its upcoming schedule in order to avoid developers having to put in super long hours to fix it now quote we're having the conversation about is it worth doing that or is it better to preserve the work-life balance and ship it later in july smith said to ask a team to do that back-to-back -back full disclosure is not a thing we want to do we try to be really careful about stuff like that end quote in other destiny news we found out last week the destiny 2 google stadia players will only be able to play with other stadia players at launch which yes. of course was covered last week it's a good point of um, clarification. but I, I think it's great to hear this. I think this is another step in the right direction for Bungie leaving Activision, right? Because potentially their publisher may have put pressure on them mm -hmm. um, to address community concerns, whereas they, being their own boss now, can say, yo, we do what we want. That's the way to do it. Um, yeah, there's two stories here. And the, the main one, the one you're talking about, is preserving work-life balance. This is a commentary that is happening it's been happening for decades, really, but it feels like it's coming up more and more often these days. There's talk of unionizing even, et cetera. Um, and recently, Epic Games faced pressure on this um, due to some reports that it was like grueling. But as it turns out, they actually just said, our office will be closed from now until July 8th for a summer break while we recharge our batteries. So they're taking like a summer solstice. Um, they do that amidst, all the time. Yeah, apparently, <laughs> yeah, maybe they do it anyway. And it's so- just, It's just being I, publicized now. <laughs> which is good because like, that's the thing is yeah. people assume the worst. Now, not to say that it isn't necessarily still grueling to work on the Fortnite team. Of course it is. They, they said, you know, the report was comparing Apex development and it's kind of slower to like all the stuff Fortnite's doing and it's apples and oranges there. But, um, you know, I believe, I don't know if it was Vince or someone at the team over at Respawn made the point of like, look, we're not going to push ourselves on a schedule like that. It's too much for Vince our team. did say that at E3, I believe. Yeah, and so anyway, if Epic is hopefully improving, that'd be great. But anyway, as it pertains to Bungie, I think it is overall the right call. I've played Destiny 2 with Lord of Wolves. It is, it's definitely vexing and it's annoying like any overpowered weapon in the Crucible. 
but I think people get tired of it after a while. Now, I'm not saying that it's like this for everybody. Sometimes you hop in and you're gonna get smashed by this weapon over and over and over again. And that is the type of experience that you're like, ugh, I just, I'm trying to enjoy the game It's a shotgun, right don't get close. I was yeah, running well, Iron Banner with the What's Good Guardians last night, the, and we went on a 12 game win streak, okay. Fran. Did we won 12 games in a nice, row, that's never happened job. to me before. That's amazing, you got that streak. So excited. Hunt the wolves. That triple valor, yes. Cut their momentum, yeah, keep valor. pushing. Woo. Did you know the voice of Lord Saladin, who runs Banner, is a Reaper in Overwatch? Did not know. Yeah, and there's actually a line in Destiny 2 when you go on a, God, it's like a 25 streak or something, and he's like, die, die, die. <coughs> Sorry, <laughs> I've been playing too much Iron Banner. <laughs> Uh, and he goes on this, he's, he keeps talking for like another like 60 seconds about being, it almost sounds like he's a roommate with Shax. He's like, Shax, can you get me any water? <laughs> anyway, uh, so Lord of Wolves is a shotgun, but it also has that, you know, release the wolves burst mode and it actually has a lot of range. And that is what is the contention here is you can pretty much, you can map people reasonably well with it if your aim is good. And anyway... I think it's the right call, I was gonna say, because yes, I don't wanna hear that the team is burnt out as we're coming up on Shadowkeep, we're introducing other problems, and there's a huge laundry list of other things that we ask for as the community, and like that's the thing, as a developer, you have a roadmap of products, and there's there's a whole team of people, really, that are like, okay, move to, do this instead, how long is this gonna take, how long is you know uh, it gonna be till we finish this so we can do the next thing, right, the product team that organizes all this stuff, and, this might just get in the way of other stuff, but it also might burn the team out. And so I, I don't know, I'm a little reserved, but like I can live with it. I'd rather that than them, like Luke said, pulling the entire weapon out of the game. Like, is it that bad? Like hopefully the community just, like, can you back off using it all the time? Like it's kind of toxic to do that. Like I used it for a little bit to test it out. And then like, that's that. Um, or if I need solar kills, but other than that. Um, so. Happy to, to see that they're doing it. I play too much Destiny. I could keep going on this, as Andrea We knows. both could keep going. <laughs> I played Destiny all weekend. But let's talk about another game I'm excited to dump a bunch of hours into. Harry Potter Wizard Unite generates $300,000 in 24 hours. Eddie, wait, you told me how to pronounce his name properly. McCoo. McCoo. Eddie mm -hmm. McCoo over at GameSpot writes, Harry Potter Wizards Unite appears to be another big success for developer Niantic Labs. According to data from research company Sensor Tower, the free-to-play mobile game pulled in $300,000 combined from Apple iOS and Google Play mobile platforms during its first 24 hours of availability. And that number only counts revenue in the United States and the United Kingdom. According to the report, Wizards Unite also reached 400,000 installs after its first day. Wizards Unite is nowhere near as popular or profitable as Niantic's previously Pokemon Go. That title generated around $2 million in revenue on its first day, according to Sensor Tower. But Wizards Unite is currently featured in the iOS App Store's games page front and center, which is surely helping its visibility and, in turn, profitability. Of course, the game is also based on one of the world's most popular media franchises, Harry Potter, and its free-to-play model gives low barrier to entry. It'll be interesting to see if Wizards Unite can succeed in delivering new content regularly to keep players interested and engaged and mm -hmm. spending money on the game. Yeah, it definitely became a sensation, you know, obviously coming on uh, using the model of Pokemon Go, but just applying it to, um, you know, Harry Potter was probably a, a pretty smart move. I, I installed it, though, by the way, and there was so much like tutorials. Like, yes, I'm going to call it like archaic game design um, of just like, hey, here's a bunch of logos and opening scene things before the star menu. Now put your name in now, put another name in. And now. Anyway, I didn't, I barely played it is my point. Did you get to play any of it? I did. You did. Yes. What do you think of it? I did like one spell. I was like, oh, this seems kind of fun. I'm with you that the onboarding, but any mobile game onboarding takes like a little bit of patience. God what forbid I, you just let me open it up and cast a spell. Right. And then you can teach me stuff later. I guess. But I mean, they have to make sure that people who have no gaming experience aren't completely lost I when know, they open it, right? They can't figure it out. No, I, I know but what you're saying. that's what mobile games they, are great at. Mobile games are bridging the gap between people who are really expert players mm -hmm. in other types of video games and people who've never played a video game before but maybe have only seen the Harry Potter movies or only read the Harry Potter books. Yeah. But then go, oh my gosh, there's a Harry Potter video game. Let me try it on my phone. Um, I think that it's a really cool setup because obviously Niantic has a lot of learnings from everything they did with Pokemon Go and so they didn't have nearly as rough of a launch with the Wizards Unite as they did with Pokemon Go if you guys remember 
that game had quite a few issues at launch. Mm-hmm. Yes, what I did. love about it is that it it, it it has that look and feel of Pokemon Go when you're out in the world with the uh, with the map overlay, of course, from from Ingress, and then it's just got all those little like tidbits that are Harry Potter esque. And I love that, you know, there's these big towers and there's like castles in the distance and the way that the spells work, I think it's just so much more engaging than Pokemon Go from yeah, the get-go. it's more than just tossing It's the more ball, than just right? flinging the Pokeball, right? And obviously I know that there's a little bit of strategy yeah. in flinging the Pokeball, but having to trace the spells yeah. and having some lore cool. behind all of these, the spells and the, the things that you're capturing, I think... S- really kind of hit me as a Harry Potter fan. So for those of us who only uh, got barely past the tutorial or haven't played at all, <laughs> what what do you do? Do you walk around the streets and then like you encounter an enemy and then you choose a spell and how, like how does it work? Like, well, from what I've played so far and I haven't played very much, okay, um, the spell is like auto chosen for you. Uh, there might be something later down the line that allows you to I dictate see. Yeah, which that's spell what I was you wondering. choose. Like, can I just cast whatever spell? Not- Barrett, Barrett. Yeah, you've been playing? On the shock mic, Baird, everybody. So, wait. Hold on, Kevin's got, getting you. We got audio. Okay. I, uh, I wasn't going to play this game. Because <laughs> I'm not, a, like, I did not like Pokemon Go. Like, uh, uh, Alyssa tried to make me play it, and I never played it. But then she was really doubling down on, like, I need to go do something, like, with people. I need to make you download this so you can play. So in the last few days, I've gotten up to level 10 already. Nice. Wow. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's just, like, an automated, like, They spell choose the spell to, for yeah. you. Um, so, yeah, there's what, nothing, like, really. What is the skill of doing the spell, though? Because you just trace it on screen? Yeah, you trace it in, like, a, depending on, like, how fast you trace it and how well you trace the spell, it'll, oh. like, um kind of dictate like oh you performed the spell like good or great or masterful and stuff okay and so if like you're up your you chances have to do it fast and accurate yes okay yeah uh that'll up your chances of actually like uh collecting the the item that you're trying to get in the, um, that encounter so cool all right i just really love the whole process of choosing my wand like yeah, did all of this research and yeah. all the different kinds of <laughs> wood that you can pick because you can you can customize your wand and then like what people don't realize is that like how you customize your wand will affect the type of spells you can cast oh right interesting. i i mm. haven't really looked into it uh yeah i just took my i looked up uh i went on to pottermore and looked up whatever wand i got from there and just chose it from that so that was cool nice do you remember what your name is in the game in the game? Yeah. Wait, like, what did you, did you just I'm pretty Andrew sure I just went with Andrea Renee. Oh, yeah. what about you? Yeah, I just went with I might have gone with name. my gamer tag, yeah. which I can give you. Yeah, afterwards. my, like, in-game, I went with uh, FM3. No underscore? But I did, uh, I'll have to come. Unified See, I can't even, like, can, just load up wait, the game. We can look at it. We can look, look at, at it later. afterwards. But so, yeah. um, just to, like, uh, thank you, Barrett, for that mini yes, report. thank you. Uh, but if you guys want to play, let me know. I'm down to go <laughs> walk around and play with you guys. I um, did. I did want to add a point of reference. Is that um, so? This made what, what is that three, here? I guess so. Yeah, there's like Amazing. a giant. Yeah, I bet you it's downstairs here, in the comic funny. book shop. Oh yeah, the comic book shop has like maybe a huge tower here. Um, anyway, I was gonna say point of reference. So what? This made three hundred thousand dollars in the first twenty four hours, as far as we knew. Uh, Pokemon Go made something like seven hundred ninety five million dollars in twenty eighteen. I think. Yes, but this and, this says two million in its first day. So two million to four hundred. Right. To yeah, that was the yeah. same day. I was just saying on the path. Let's see mm-hmm. how far it goes. But in a year, Pokemon Go made something like seven hundred ninety-five million. Uh, although a game like Fortnite makes well, or made last year upwards of three billion dollars. So you know, we'll see where Harry Potter goes. But three hundred thousand dollars is no slouch. Exactly. So, nice job, Pottermore. Well, Fran. We're going to have to wait and see just how well Harry Potter Wizards Unite does at the end of 2019, but it's so far away. If we wanted to know something a little bit more immediate, like what came to the Mom and Grab Digital Shops today, where would we go? The official list of up and com- the official list of upcoming <laughs> software across each and every platform as listed by the kind of funny show Games Daily show host each and every weekday. Man, I try to ad-lib this sometimes. read it, Fred. I hate reading it, though. We have to say it every week, and I'm like, why don't I know it by now? Because we know, read Fred. it every week. I don't know. Anyway, you know where to find it. Right here. All right, what is out today, Andrea? Out today, Heavy Rain is finally available on PC. So if you missed it back in its uh, PlayStation days, you can mm-hmm. play it on PC now. Um, Azure and Tales Trials is out on Switch. Devil May Cry is out on Switch, which I did not wow. realize was coming to Switch. Um, Horusco Reference is out on Mac and PC, and all would cry beware 
What the heck is that? What? It's okay. on PC and Mac. Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2, Serve the Dark Gods, the Massive Chaos Campaign Expansion is available today. And... It's time to soak up some rays during Fortnite's 14 days of summer. Each day, players can drop into Fortnite for something new. In Battle Royale, a new item will be unvaulted each day for 24 hours. There will be a new LTM featured each day and each daily challenge and free rewards, new outfits, and more in the item shop. Players can also jump into Creative each day for a new featured island. And in Save the World, players can complete a new quest every day to help home base host the hottest summer party around and score some summer freebies in the store. Players can complete quests to earn heaps of summer tickets. Completing all 14 will unlock a new explosive weapon. Mm-hmm. New dates. Today, the arcade crew of Dark Devotion released the launch date of the upcoming Contra-esque platformer Blazing Chrome. It's going to be coming to PC, Xbox One, PS4, and NSX. What's that? Am I having I a brain know fart that here? As well. On July 11th. What is NSX, everybody? Tell us and you're wrong. <laughs> we were, Andrew and I are the same. We're like, we should know. Uh... I don't know. I only see VMware NSX, which is maybe not it. No. Uh, yeah. Tell us don't in the. Know. I don't know. Don't know. You know, uh, GameCube was GCN and NGC, depending on which, if you're in Japan or over here. So NGC, GCN, got very confusing. <laughs> Inaccurate. That's not what it, it is. <laughs> not what it is um i don't have a deal of the day a deal of the day friend you're rubbing off on me now what be- the heck man <laughs> buy a guy a drink that. first i was right? crushing it today so uh, far i know i know i i got us in a, a very loosey-goosey kind of mood here i think so. there is a pretty impressive sale happening on um the playstation store a bunch mm-hmm. of games are super cheap if you're interested and apparently, according to our friend Wario64, you can get the Steam version of Monster Hunter World for just $31.68. Yes. And if you're chasing the Cyberpunk 2077 Collector's Edition for PS4 is back in stock, uh, according to IGN, and it's 17% off Cyber twen- it's so Cyberpunk 2077. Though. Yeah, $249 to pre-order the Cyberpunk <sighs> 2077 Collector's Edition for PS4. Holy cow, it comes with so much stuff, except that sweet jacket we got at E3. Did you happen to have one or no? Of course nice. I got one. That's like Tim's favorite thing now. We have a reversible vinyl samurai uh, jacket. It's like yellow reversed and black and sort of yellow. And we got it by watching the demo. That was a really cool gift. It was indeed. All right, let's move on to reader mail. And today it's brought to you by Third Love. Let's get you a better bra, people. Jen, Gia, and more of the kind of honeys love the Third Love bra, and you will too. Third Love uses data points generated by millions of women who have taken their Fit Finder quiz to design bras with breast size and shape in mind for a perfect fit and premium feel. Third Love offers more than 70 sizes, including their signature half cup sizes. You can skip the trip and find your fit with Third Love's online Fit Finder. Order and try on at home. No more awkward fitting room experiences. Every customer has 60 days to wear it. Wash it and put it to the test. And if you don't love it, return it and Third Love will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. Third Love's team of expert fit stylists are dedicated to helping you find your perfect fit. And fit stylists are available every day to help via text, chat, or phone. And returns and exchanges are free and easy. This is hands down the most comfortable bra you'll own with straps that won't slip and tagless labels so no itching. Third Love knows that there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they are offering our listeners 15% off your first order. Go to Third love.com slash games now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash games for 15% off today. Their lounge bra is super comfortable. Hmm. It's great for summer when you're sitting around playing video games and it's too hot to put a shirt on. Just throw the lounge bra on. There you go. Next up, Experian. You know, the better your credit score, the easier it is to get the stuff you want or less you have to pay. So the question is, why is it so hard to raise your score? Now it won't be thanks to Experian. They've launched Experian Boost, a brand new way to instantly increase your credit score your credit scores for free. For the first time ever, paying your utilities and cell phone bill can instantly improve your credit score. Experian Boost by working you give, 
Experian Boost works by giving you credit for the bills you're already paying through your bank account, like water, gas, electric, cable, and cell phone. A higher credit score can help you establish and get access to credit and preferred rates for the things you want and need in life. Experian is on a mission to help boost America's credit score, which will help millions of people across the country build and get better access to credit. People all across America have already raised their credit scores with Experian Boost, and you should too. It used to take months to see your credit score rise a point or two. With Boost, you can increase your credit scores instantly. Boost is free to use and only available from Experian. Up until now, you've been paying your utility and cell phone bills and not getting any credit for it. But now you can. Greg panicked two years ago when he discovered an old credit card was dinging his credit score. It took a while for him to build it back up and Experian Boost would have been really helpful back then. We can't believe it's taken this long for someone to do this. What are you guys waiting for? Experian Boost can potentially help you establish or increase your access to credit. Boost your FICO score instantly for free. The Boost is only available at Experian.com slash KF Games. That's EXP. E-R-I-A-N dot com slash K-F games. Credit scores are important, y'all. So they important. Are. Get started on that stuff early. Mm-hmm. Use stuff like this. Um, like, yeah, I can't. I know some people that just like, I don't want a credit card. I don't trust myself. Like, I don't care lot. if you don't. And if I'm you like, want one, you have to have one. Get one with a low limit then and just pay your bills with it. Um, just basics because like and building credit. Off man. at the end of the month. Every yeah, month. Exactly. just set it up on auto pay. Just but put your gas on it or whatever. That, yeah. And that's what this is getting at. You're doing a lot of that stuff anyway. And actually, that's what some of this seems to be solving is like you don't necessarily have to do that. You can use Experian Boost. To figure it out. Anyway, we weren't paid to say that part, but um, we weren't. It's true. It's just we just facts. take your credit Those are very adult seriously. Adult facts. Adult best friends. Yeah. All right, on to reader mail. The most um, important question. <laughs> should I just read the question, jo- Andrew? From Joe Beezer. Uh, I feel like I should take my glasses off. Yeah. For this. Um, Kevin, I'm going to need a, uh, a close up on the one. On the on, on the one. On the one. Um, and then we'll so, read the question. And so let me fix my hair for you, Joe. Yeah, so he specifically wrote <laughs> in and says, Andrea. If you could raise your eyebrows into the camera for a second without saying anything, it would make my day. Have a good one regardless. So I'm going to do two. We're going to do the single <laughs> eyebrow takes. and then the double eyebrow. Andrew, I okay. don't know. This kind of sounds like a Cam, I'm, I'm watching. <laughs> I'm hoping you're going to use this to make some kind of funny meme. Okay. If you're using it for creepy, nefarious purposes, I'm going to be upset. Well, good for you. You know what I mean? Cue her being upset. Okay, here man. we go. <laughs> single like eyebrow. Now, like now double eyebrows. Mm-hmm. I did surprise. Should I do something else? Should I do angry? Shock. Shock. All very good. Perfect. Angry. There you go. Now, angry. You All right. Angry. Well done. Angry. I don't think I can. Oh, angry, you have to furrow. You yeah, can't right. raise. Yeah. That was a stupid comment. I'm right? sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have fun right. over here at Kind of Funny Games Good Daily. question, Joe Breezer. All right. CJ Schumer says, hello, KFGD crew. I was wondering how you all feel about the balance between live service games offering content at launch versus post-launch. Paul Sage, the creative director for Borderlands 3, mentioned in an interview with VentureBeat that while the team wanted to bring their complete vision to the upcoming game, the pressure of a ship date forced them to cut content in certain areas. That being said, Gearbox is still planning for both paid and free DLC to come to Borderlands 3 after its launch this September. Would you rather a game release earlier with the promise for a longer pipeline of post-launch content or wait longer for a game with more to play up front with less content coming on the back end? It seems like for a developer, the former option could be better given its respective game will have more attention on it over a longer period of time. Thanks, CJ. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, for starters, no, I don't want to wait forever if there's, like, call it enough. It's hard to quantify this question because we don't know, like, how much content is being withheld or what it is exactly. I'm going to have to assume that it's not, like, just a huge amount, but it's something. So, yeah, like, you know, uh, what, perfect is the enemy of good or, or what is it? There's a saying that goes something it, like that. But, um, you know, if you're out there trying to perfect the experience, you want to get everything, like, a game will never be done. And, and Borderlands 2 released in September of 2012. Like, you know, I know that there was Handsome Collection and all that stuff, but, like, I, I think we've waited long enough. So I'm all right with it. But I was a little surprised, too, that they just, like, threw the comment out. I was like, yeah, we took some stuff, or we couldn't put the stuff in the game, so we'll sell it to you later. Um, I mean, I, I already ha- I already trust them to give us a pretty beefy experience that I think that's why a, a developer like um, Gearbox Gearbox can <laughs> hired the train outside and it just distracted me. Uh, why a developer like Gearbox can um, you know get away with this? Other developers who would say something like this, I think, might get skewered. 
because if they have like let's just say Activision a Call of Duty team said something like this, I just feel like differently they'd be like oh you know dare you you know and and with borderlands i feel like we're all like yeah but there's there's going to be a lot in the game i mean i have trust in that we don't know that yet i think it really depends on the track record of the developer gearbox has done really well with the expansions and post launch post launch content that they put out for their previous borderlands game so i have full faith that they will do well here but i think what Paul Sage is saying is something that's very common throughout game development. You have to have a ship date. Otherwise, as creatives, you just keep iterating and iterating and iterating and saying, well, what if we add this thing? Or what if we add this thing? You have to cut off the flow at some point and say, hey, why don't we save that for future releases? Personally, I would prefer a smaller experience at launch with more things to come post-launch. Because I think about a game like Dragon Quest XI when it launched last fall. And the development team very specifically said, we don't want to do post-launch content. We want to put everything inside the game when we ship it. And that's a very specific choice. But then that means you're getting a game that has over 100 hours of content in the box, which isn't a bad thing. Obviously, it's a lot of value for people Mm -hmm. who are very excited about playing that specific franchise. But as somebody who plays a lot of games, I'm like, dang, that turns me off of wanting to play it because that's way too much. I'm never going to be able to finish that game. Right. You know, I like to be able to see the end of the tunnel and then after I complete a game, if they're like, hey, we're going to do another story to help complete that experience, I think that to me is more exciting. Like how with, if you think about Horizon Zero Dawn, I thought that that campaign was really evenly paced and then they released the Frozen Wilds, which added on to the story, you know, several months later, I think 10 months later. No, not that many months later. Eight months later? Uh, This this is the kind of funny.com slash you're a wrong moment, I guess. Not that it really matters, but... I think that something like that is more approachable because then I can go, okay, I finished the story and I feel good about finishing it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want stuff to be dragged out either. And that's a, a, maybe a good side effect is when you have to like make these decisions, it's like you're only focused on what's in there and you're polishing up that experience. I mean, again, we don't know where this would have fit in, whether it was a post beating the game experience or whatever. But um, anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't concern me that much. Uh, we do know there's Borderlands 3 season pass coming. I don't know if we know if they're, what, what the price is and how that works. Yeah. I'm looking at, you know, I've, I've looked at the pages for the pre-order and it's just like season pass is coming and it includes four campaign DLC packs, new stories, missions, and challenges. Uh, and it will be, all the stuff will be available by a year later, September, 2020. I don't know how much more we know than that, but... Um, Whatever they've decided to push out will be part of that. If it's four story campaign add-ons with new missions and challenges, mm-hmm. I would guess it's probably going to be in ideally. the twenty nine ninety nine to thirty nine ninety nine mark mm-hmm. That's for what I was all thinking. that stuff, including the cosmetic items. So, but you know, we, as you mentioned, don't know yet. Yeah, I don't think we know yet. If we do, it'll be in kindoffunny dot com slash you're wrong very exactly. shortly. So. All right, which one do you want to go to next here, Fran? Um, by the way, you can call me Florian Grayback. That was the. <laughs> That was the name I chose for my Harry Potter character. Oh. Fro- Florian Greyback. Okay. Uh, because that's like Harry Potter names. You got to have a little fun with it, Kevin. You know, I, role play. I mean, I'm kind of funny, Kevin, so. Uh, great. Very creative. Unified branding. You can just call me Florian. <laughs> or, All right. Or whatever. Uh, let's see. Which question <laughs> do we want to go? Uh, I say. I say. I say as Florian. <laughs> Um, I don't know, Andrea. I, either one's fine by me. I really don't care. Okay. So, here we go. Michael Gulliver says, Yeah. Happy Monday to Team Frandria. With companies like Limited Run Games releasing games on physical media for reprint, or for the first time, like their most recent Star Wars for Game Boy NES is a particular highlight, what games would you like to see released again in physical edition to ensure it isn't lost in the digital revolution? Thanks. Oh, it says, love both of you guys. Andrew, hope you're feeling better. Love from Buckinghamshire, England. Buckinghamshire. Buckinghamshire. Mm-hmm. That's a fantastic city name. I wish we had cool city names like that. Actually, we do. Are you it's we do. The really city yeah. isn't a cool city name. I mean, no, it's not. You're taking everything. So San Francisco? San Francisco's okay. Come on, it's, like, it's got your name in it. Nah. There's much cooler United States city names. Yeah, than like that. Tallahassee. Yeah, I like Tallahassee. See, that's a good one. Really? There's many other ones, like Albuquerque. Like Fargo? No, well, not like Fargo, Fargo is iconic. There's no doubt about it. Thank like, you. Thank you, movies. Uh, anyway, to answer the question, uh, it's funny that like I'm, 
I'm not a collector anymore. I have stuff. I have a couple things that I'm really proud that I have, uh, like an original Famicom, uh, Super Famicom Metroid, Super Metroid. And I also have a spice colored GameCube that is signed by Anuma, Iwata, and hmm. Miyamoto. Very nice. That was amazing. Um, and I have a couple, like, I never collect, those are more collector items. But I guess my point is, like, physical stuff, I just, I don't want it anymore now i do understand why people want to make sure that when all the servers shut down when when the pre-apocalypse hits that you have your game so you can play them in your bunker so anyway <laughs> under that guy but, but the question is specifically to ensure it isn't lost in the digital that's revolution. what i was just trying to illustrate yeah. was that whatever the digital revolution works fine but i guess if this pre-apocalypse comes and you're in your bunker with power and you're playing something and you're like man i'm really glad i have this Oh boy, there'd be there'd be a lot of games I think that I'd want to make sure that I had. But this is more about Reuli, so um, I'm gonna stick with yeah. I'd love. Well, l wait. Let me ask this, Andrea. Mm -hmm. When when they say a reprint, mm -hmm. it has to be. It's like not a release on a new platform, right? You have to have the old platform and a reprint for it. Is I that the idea? I would imagine. Or if could it's I a, just get if it's it on a like if it's a reprint? It's for 4. it's for new. It's for new platforms so that you don't necessarily need the old See, technology to be able to read it. See, this was like, he's talking about, um, you know, Game Boy cartridges and NES cartridges. And like, it means you have to have a working old console as well. I guess that's true because so. the specific, the Star Wars. They're really cool. The Star Wars thing that he's talking about mm -hmm. is um, on one of its original consoles. So. Yeah. No, and that is it. It's these really cool, either never released before or, you know, reprints with like really cool art but, that comes with them and stuff like that. So I'm just going to put Super Metroid out there again. I love oh, a re release I mean, that's a of great it. One. So it looks like they're also the putting chance. it on PS4, though. And that was the point I was trying to make is, man, I know it doesn't make any sense, but I would just love like a Blu ray, you know, Metroid Prime. Uh, you know, for PlayStation Four or whatever, and uh, that that I just want like a sweet collector's edition for Metroid Prime. I'm a big Metroid fan, so that's those are the two I'm going with. Is there anything in that vein? Oh, by the way, a new cut, like new art, and like really make it worthwhile. Yeah, because you saw this one for Star Wars Bounty Hunter. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, so it says only 7,500 copies available worldwide, region free. That's pretty cool. Um, it's so hard to pick because there's so many great classic games. If I'm just thinking about my personal history with games and some of the classic games that I would love to have um, like on current platforms. I think See, of a I game know, like right? Myst and oh, how much Myst. time oh. I spent with that game on PC Yeah, because it would, ha it would almost have to be a reprint because like it came on, I think, both floppy and eventually CD, but now you'd want it on Blu-ray or something like that, I guess. And I think you can get it on GOG right now, right? Probably. Probably. See, that's the dead, dead has a digital. lot of weird Mist is a good stuff. one. Yeah. I like that. I'd say something like Mist. Um, I also think about... Um, King's Quest. <laughs> that was never, that? I was no? never into King's I Quest. I like King's Quest. But. No, it was never one of my things. I, I guess is there, I just, No, go ahead. I was going to say, is there anything maybe that you remember that like didn't sell enough copies and you missed buying it at the time? I mean, I think that's also what this address is, is sometimes something... Uh, didn't like sell a lot or whatever um and you might want to reprint like there was um what is it uh the boots no bancho or uh cubivore on gamecube was this oh, you were cool. yes cube that ate other cube it was a really weird game uh but there's stuff like that that probably didn't see like many copies released or hey i i might buy superman 64 reprint on the N64 oh, just because okay. like you want that that hot mess like it you can't get it it's very hard to get so it's stuff like that maybe yeah or even like out? you could t take a game like Goldeneye too right Ooh, yeah there you go because I feel like if you look you at games that carts. were very pivotal or innovative or important to the overall like trajectory yeah. of the video games industry I think those games are important because clearly we can't save all the games not all the games are worth saving quite frankly but like <laughs> I, I, would, I would I would love to play some Aladdin from Super Nintendo. Oh yeah. But see, live my, like, my memories in the Cave of Wonders. I could go yeah. for that. A lot of this stuff you can get out there, but like Yeah, I mean there's again, ROMs for virtually anything. ROMs, right? yes, but, but meaning physical copies. Like reprints, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean you can get used Goldeneye like on eBay, I'm sure, very easily. If not, then I should maybe. No, but like I want a fresh that. a freshie. Okay. A freshie. That's fair. A freshie, a freshie. you know? <laughs> yeah, not not one of these used copies that's been in and out of that system. Okay. What if they didn't eject it properly, Fran? You think oh about yeah, that, that's Fran? true. You think that about is true. the ejection process. I mean, you could ruin your cartridges if you don't eject properly. Okay, if you just rip it out, problem. you can't you do can that. You can lose your save. You're not going to ruin the cartridge. It's fine. Oh my gosh. Okay. 
Did you know? Wait, 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 while we're on the topic, <laughs> on. do you know if you? I don't know if you search for this still on Google, but if you search here, I'm gonna try NES NES blow cartridge. I used to be one of the top results in images because uh, BuzzFeed. Yeah, I'm the th <laughs> I'm the third image. Oh, Kevin, NES, now, now you have to search this so everybody can see it. Blow. Well, make sure there's nothing. To, yeah, that that's a safe. Don't search. worry about it. I got it. But yeah, I'm the third result because I did a tutorial. And I specifically, so I did a tutorial on cleaning your cartridges for IGN Insider at the time, and I was like, use, you know, alcohol and That's him right there. There I am, that's Fred. I took this photo, <laughs> I took it and staged it specifically. It looks like you're kissing it. No, I'm it blowing like it in a car. To. But I had like them take it. the photo that's to great. demonstrate what not to do, and BuzzFeed goes and uses the image to say, don't do this. And I was like, that's what I was saying, but they sort of like got people thinking that that's I what was, I was doing. I was looking at this you, and I was like, no, this is wrong. You shouldn't do it like this. Do you this. like my uh, boy so band highlights in this, by the way? It's like slightly red. Oh, I can't really tell because yeah. you have that light on yeah. top. But it actually is. It's like slight little frosted tips. I'm going to go away. Kind of scary. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> glad I brought that up. It's that uh, kind of Monday. Eduardo. Game Go writes in and says, Hi, Frantria. Hope you're having a great Monday. It was great meeting you two at E3. I recently saw Raising Kratos, and it was very interesting to see the developer side of games creation and marketing and the sacrifices and hard work it took to make a masterpiece. Fantastic documentary, by the way, if you guys haven't seen it. My question, what game would you love to see a documentary on and why? I would choose either Metal Gear Solid Five to learn the full details about the Koni Kojima Konami ordeal or Days Gone to see how a studio and its devs deal with a game that doesn't get nines and tens like God of War did. I think it'd be interesting and would do a lot to show viewers why sometimes games fail to be perfect, though still enjoyable. Keep up the great hosting, Eddie. I mean, there's so much to choose from. Do you, do you want to go first on this one? I thought Metal Gear was sort of the obvious, really smart one, especially I mean, five. not for me, because I'm not a Metal Gear person. Um, when I think about, I mean, I do appreciate the conversation that you and Tim had last Friday about how you yeah, how do we to get more, more um, documentarian stuff. Like, yeah, Danny mm -hmm. and Noclip just did another one today on uh, Supergiant and Hades. And like, again, that's like, if he wasn't able to set that up and do them, you know, we might have never seen that. And frankly, he probably was looking at somebody else and like, you got to choose. So the, the more of that, the better. But anyway, if you could. It's tough because in one hand, I'm like, I really want to see a feel good story about a studio that had a lot of challenges, but then really knocked it out of the park at launch. But then on the other hand, I'm like, ooh, there's some good controversies that would be yeah. interesting to hear some like backstory about mm -hmm. everything that happened and kind of what went wrong. Yeah, and, and by the way, this assumes that it's a tell-all, right? Because Raising Kratos was produced by them and Sony, right? I mean, ultimate. So it's approved. So in other words, like, sure, they put in some, like, honesty in there, and I haven't watched it yet, um, only because, like, I'm at the very... <laughs> It's sad. I'm at the very end of God of War, and I just can't bring myself to finish it because I want but uh, the uh, ending this is armor so set. Good. I know. I, I almost sat down and did it last night, and I started playing Division again. <sighs> the grind it gets you. Anyway, uh, what I'm getting at here, right? There's a little um, approved nature, but we're going to assume, for the purpose of this discussion, that it's tell all. That it's a any you know you documented everything, and we got to see it all. So Anthem, sort of like I, mean, I think that's an obvious recent one that I would have loved to see, like the meetings about you know flying should be in the game or not and like there's all kinds of really interesting stuff that apparently happened with anthem according to jason's report but anything else pop out for you um i would really love to hear about the history of Fortnite. so i've heard oh, yeah. some really good um i don't even know if they're rumors or gossip but the whole idea of Fortnite, how Fortnite came into existence and the things that I, the rumblings that I've been hearing is that essentially Fortnite was originally uh, created to be a demo vehicle for the Unreal Engine 4. And that huh. when they originally like, had the idea for Fortnite, they built it to show developers this is what the engine is capable of doing uh, and the kinds sense. of things that you can build within the engine. And mm -hmm. we're going to show you because we're the ones making the engine. Because if you think about where Fortnite started back in like when the first time they showed it, I believe was 2013. And, or maybe it was 2012, no, I think it was 2013. And how dramatically different yeah, yeah. it is today than when they first showed it off. I would really love to hear from the team at Epic about 
where the genesis for this project was and the journey that they went on over several years of iterating. Because when I first played it at Judges Week several years ago, it was just Save the World, but it wasn't even called Save the World back then. And the Mm -hmm. idea of Battle Royale hadn't even really been broached. They had mentioned that they were looking at PvP modes, but the Battle Royale specifically was not mentioned at all. And so I would really love to hear like that journey and how they got there from this thing that was something totally different than what it is today and like their path to making billions of dollars with it and they're yeah. building their community and really they, changing a lot of what they do at Epic as a company mm-hmm. to accommodate for this massive behemoth that they created. Yep. Yeah, they've talked about it a little bit, I think, and actually, uh, maybe not so coincidentally, I actually was able to do an expert mode with uh, Eric, you know, who's the lead designer on um, Fortnite, you know, the, the Battle Royale and there was an interesting story there of how fast he got thrown into it. And so again, these were only, you know, eight to 12 minute pieces, but it's a glimpse into what you're talking about. But yeah, I'd love the tell all version of that because yeah, it went on for what, five or six years of development. And then we all know PUBG came out and, and other stuff. And suddenly, basically what happened is you'll, you'll hear, they admit they're like, it was July before the game Battle Royale came out in September. That's when they started Battle Royale for Fortnite, building on this Save the World that you talked about. It's, it's really wild. amazing to hear. So yeah, I, there's so many I would want to hear. I'm, I'm a big Nintendo fan, so anything with that team um, in particular around Ocarina of Time, but also in between Wind Waker and the CG demo that they had for GameCube of the realistic looking like Ganondorf swinging his sword around and the decisions that were made. I always reference that um, I was maybe one of the few in the press at the time, but they released screenshots that Link's eyes in Wind Waker were a certain color. And I noticed they were different. I asked, I think it was Miyamoto about it. And he was like, oh, that's interesting. We were gonna have his eyes change color depending on what was happening in the environments. And like they they pulled it out. And anyway, any detail like that, I think it's just fascinating, so. Indeed. All right, I think that's gonna do it for Reader Mail for today. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to head to do we have a squad up today i, I didn't see i'll double one. check why you uh, if you want to check yes. you're wrong okay so as we mentioned if you're watching live at twitch.tv slash kind of funny games we ask you to go to kind of funny.com slash you're wrong so checking here um kebab says technically both of you are streaming together right now kebabs you knew what we that's had. wow <laughs> got technicality you. got us on a technicality <laughs> got you the nanobiologist says gary has been advertising doing a live commentary of book of eli when it's on netflix and discussing a draft of the script as well the current streams are to test to prepare for it and end up being three plus hour q a's oh, twitch.tv <laughs> slash gary witta everybody if you want to go check them out bless him this sweet man um Oh, this is an uh, important. Thank you, Lord of Pwn. Important news to not forget about. Speaking of donation charity streams, Summer Games Done Quick is currently going on this week with donations going to Doctors Without Borders. Nice. I believe our friends over at Funhouse did their 24-hour yeah. stream yesterday. Maybe just, it's just finished finishing. It. Just finished, I think, this morning or something, yeah. Um, I saw him on Twitter. It was like 10 hours to go, and my Twitter feed said 15 hours ago. And I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, um, ETH Demon, thank you for putting this in, because I was going to mention it on Gamescast this week, and we will uh, correct it on Gamescast. Um, Cyberpunk is based on a pen and paper RPG, and it's not a brand new IP created by CD Projekt Red. So it is based on a pen and paper RPG. Okay. Correct. Because, yeah, it came up on... Was it Gamescast or something? We were talking or, about it on Gamescast and I E3. swore yeah. that it did, but the way that you know it was said on the show, and you know how I get... I, no, we very I, specifically I like, said, I don't know. And I think uh, we were all like, I think it's new. So thank you for the correction. Yeah. We will bring this up on Gamescast I was remembering well. that um, I feel like Max Scoville over at IGN did a piece on all of the references because he used to do this thing called Study Hall and then it evolved into something he did at IGN. You should check it out. It was, yeah, believe on Cyberpunk. And he, he probably brings up this, uh, this you know, source material. What right. else? I'm going down here. Um, hey, nanobiologist, that isn't breaking news about the EA giving mm-hmm. up performance bonuses. We covered that in breaking news last week, Tim and I did, at the end of uh, Thursday's Ropa Report. Oh, dude. So you we, burnt. So we, we were going <laughs> to, friend had it in the rundown tonight. I was like, nah, nah, we covered we that already. Co- but see, yeah, because I didn't see that full show yeah. and it wasn't yeah, in the rundown. So I didn't any know. Any of the show I, I heard somewhere. I mean, if I'm not on it? Yeah. Well. Andrea watches every show. Does she? Um, she's a beast, though. I watch yeah, like ninety percent of the shows. Yeah. Some beast. weeks, uh, some weeks I can't get to them all. We can yeah. agree that 
Andrew are better than Fran. I mean, yeah, but the, you know, then you got to sit through like a producer arguing with a host, and then it like I, it goes on and on and. Antonio on. Batista says NSX equals Nintendo Switch. Who abbreviates Nintendo Switch that's to NSX? That's right. See, I knew that's, weird. that's. I think why NGC popped in my head, uh, because I think they use it on. Um, you know, vendor uh, sites and stuff like NSX. But anyway, nobody says that. Uh, nanobiologist says, deal of the day, Warhammer Vermintide 2 Deluxe Edition. It's $40 on Amazon and Best Buy for PS4 and Xbox One. Thanks, Wario64. That's Again, a good-looking game, too, man. Please go to Wario64, at Wario64 on Twitter. He frequently uses affiliate links. We want to make yep. sure he yes, gets so credit for putting these deals out there. He's a friend of the show, so make sure to um, give him credit where credit is due. Um, hmm, Anything hmm. else? Let's see here. Um, my, yeah, wait. My, oh, what is this? Um, Alia D. Fop says Cyberpunk 2770 pre-order on Amazon for forty nine ninety nine. Uh, really? That's a pretty good deal. Yeah, it is. It's ten dollars off. Ten bucks off. Um, thank you, Kebabs. The Frozen Wilds came out ten months after the base game in November, so I was correct the first time. But then Lord of Pwn says came out November seventh, a little over eight months after the game came out. Okay. Oh, yeah. kebabs. It's pronounced Buckingham Shear. Buckingham Shear. Is it really? That's what he says. That sounds wrong. That sounds wrong. Kebabs is from like <laughs> Australia or, uh, right? You're not from England. I know you got the accent that's similar, but like, I don't know if we can trust it. It's not the same legal. And uh, wait, instead, so, John Ad says Buckingham Shear is a county, not a city. It's a county? Oh. So it's more oh. A county. San Mateo County or San Francisco. Why didn't they give us their city? Come on. Not sure. Give it up. Dox yourself. Uh, Don't dox yourself. Don't dox anybody. No doxing. Buckinghamshire. All right. Um, Zaire says deal of the day Resident Evil 7 Biohazard Gold Edition, Darksiders 3, and Destiny 2 Forsaken Legendary Collection are all 20 bucks on PS4 and Xbox One at GameStop's online store. Oh. And if you're wondering, wait, isn't Destiny free? Not the no, Forsaken stuff. No, not the stuff. Forsaken stuff, but we don't know how much it's going to cost. So wait, it was 20 bucks? 20 bucks. So yeah, if you already own the other stuff, it might be worth getting. But my guess is it won't be more than 20 bucks when Shadow keeps out in September for that pack. It'll probably be mm. less than that is my guess. Probably, dude. Um, Spencer, thank you for the clarification. Just a quick heads up with the uh, limited run game Star Wars stuff. All of their LucasArts games will be reproductions and require original hardware. The only ones that don't follow the rule are Star Wars Bounty Hunter, Racer's Revenge, and Jedi Starfighter. Those PS2 games are specifically the emulated version on PS4. But <laughs> hey, trophy support. The reason these are PS4 discs and not the original PS2 discs is due to Sony not allowing publishers to print PS2 discs anymore. Fun fact, Sony's factories can still print PS2 games, but just don't have online tools to help publishers submit art for physical PS2 games. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Very fascinating. <laughs> that that is a whole other world. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, kebabs, in case uh, Drew Baca didn't send it in, Epic did a GDC talk about Fortnite's development and its shift to Battle Royale. Awesome. Be sure to check that as well. I still, right after I still want a full documentary. I accidentally moved something. Undo. There we go. Um, it says the nanobiologist Fortnite was actually shown off first at Spike's VGAs back in 2011. Couldn't find the actual date of when it was shown as a tech demo. That was, I believe, 2013 when I saw it behind closed doors at Judges Week. So you wouldn't be able to find a date for that because we didn't talk hmm. about it publicly. Yeah, but they hmm, they clearly had ideas for it, though, then if it was at the Spike VGAs. But anyway, yes, that game went through a lot of iteration and evolution. Worked out for him. Yes. <laughs> uh, hey, nanobiologist, within that article about Patrick Sutherland giving up his $20 million bonus, there is also a paragraph about other EA executives giving up their bonuses. So Yeah, for about, so the, yeah. Yeah, the story we're all referencing, by the way, is that EA execs gave up their bonus due to performance mm -hmm. of the company. And that bonus they gave up supposedly went back towards developer bonuses. And there was like four or $5 million, I think, that that pool became out of the execs. Then there was a story right within there about Patrick Sutherland being offered yeah. some $20 million sum to stay. They were tied together, yeah. Right? And we, don't, we actually don't know where and if that went anywhere, right? I think it was speculative that it probably went to Right, no, the, well, the, the thought was that he took the money yeah. and left. And that was the assumption. That and the then they revealed, then Andrew Wilson revealed it afterwards as part of the game Daily.biz uh, deep dive that they did that 
in fact, no, he didn't take that 20 million. And in fact, actually all of the execs put their bonuses yeah, back into the company to help fund uh, mm -hmm. more game development. So yeah. anyway, that's going to do it for us today on Kind of Funny Games mm -hmm. Daily. Did somebody update the doc with who's hosting tomorrow? Is it you? Isn't Are you there? there? Is it not there? I think I'm hosting tomorrow. We Greg's back. It's, it's I think right it's there. Greg and Andrea tomorrow. Yeah, I think it's uh, you know your normal Tuesday crew. Uh, we hope that you guys will participate and send us in your questions. Patreon.com slash games. if you want to do that. Fran, if people want to keep up with you, where should they go? I was just about to cue you up <laughs> and ask you that. If you like me and want to see me on the show, you can also support me at twitch.tv slash fm3 under score you can head over there catch me usually evening specific time but uh fire up that notification because you never know when i'm gonna go live and then of course i'm in the epic creator store as well it's an easy way to support me for free if you're out there buying games on the store it's just fran mirabella on the store andrew what about you where can we support oh, you? oh you know we're just holding it down at what's good games you guys know where to find us um we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up kevin what can viewers who are watching live on twitch look forward to seeing immediately after this show uh, we have cool friends with uh, some cool people. Mark Ellis. Cool and friends. Ken Hopsack. Woo! I remembered all that. Good we stuff. have cool wow. friends. Good job, yeah, Kevin. Look yeah. at you. You'll be a producer someday. What? Wow. <laughs> I'm just I'm kidding. Wow. He produces a screencast. You guys should watch no, it. It's you're great. doing a great job, Kevin. All right. That's it for us. It's been our pleasure to serve. Goodbye, everybody.